Hello class. This week we will be covering chapter seven, Energy for Cells, in the Essentials of Biology textbook, sixth edition. Okay, so the first section we're going to cover is section 7.1, cellular respiration. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to explain the role of cellular respiration in a cell, state the overall reaction for glucose breakdown, and list the four phases of cellular respiration and identify the location of each within the cell. Okay. So no matter what you are doing, from playing soccer to studying or even sleeping, your cells are using energy. These activities are powered at the cellular level by adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. ATP molecules are produced during cellular respiration by the breakdown of organic molecules, primarily the carbohydrate glucose. With the participation of the mitochondria within eukaryotic cells. Okay, and so the mitochondria is pictured right here. Just as respiration or breathing takes in oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide, within your cells, a similar process occurs during respiration. In fact, cellular respiration, which occurs primarily in the mitochondria of every cell of the body, is the reason why you breathe to begin with. Furthermore, you will come to discover over the next few slides that cellular respiration is ultimately the reverse of photosynthesis, from the starting reactants to the end products. However, the metabolic pathway that takes place in between start and end is very different. Okay, so let's touch on the idea that just like photosynthesis, cellular respiration is also a redox reaction. So oxidation of substrates is a fundamental part of cellular respiration. Oxidation represents the removal of electrons and hydrogen ions from a molecule. These are then used to reduce a second molecule. The combination of an oxidation and a reduction reaction is commonly referred to as, again, a redox reaction. So just like photosynthesis, cellular respiration is an excellent example of a redox reaction. During cellular respiration, glucose is oxidized to form carbon dioxide. And that is because the electrons or the hydrogen ions were removed. So oxidation is loss. <clears throat> Oxygen, on the other hand, is reduced to water, okay? And it is reduced because it gains electrons. So oxygen is reduced and is formed water, okay? And then in addition to that, you're also gonna get a byproduct of energy. Now, this reaction again should, should look quite familiar. Notice that if you reverse the arrow in this equation, you obtain the overall reaction for photosynthesis. In cellular respiration, the oxidation of carbohydrates produces energy and carbon dioxide. In photosynthesis, the reduction of carbon dioxide uses energy from the sun, producing carbohydrates. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how glucose is broken down into steps. So the breakdown of glucose releases a lot of energy. However, unlike the burning of sugar on a stove, which releases most of the energy as heat, the cell controls the reactions so that the glucose molecules are broken down slowly. This allows the energy in the bonds of the glucose molecule to be more efficiently captured and used to make ATP molecules. Now, the enzymes that carry out oxidation during cellular respiration are assisted by non-protein helpers called coenzymes. <clears throat> 
So as glucose is oxidized, the coenzymes NAD plus and FAD receive hydrogen atoms in the form of hydrogen ion plus an electron. And they then become reduced to NADH and FADH2, respectively. OK. So this depiction here summarizes all of the steps that occur during cellular respiration. The first step here is glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell and not in the mitochondria. And this is the breakdown of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. Energy is invested to activate glucose, uh, where two ATP are gained and oxidation results in NADH which will be used later for additional ATP production, OK? So there is glycolysis. We do get an output of two ATP at the end of this. And then we also get an output of a few of our coenzymes, such as NADH, during the process of glycolysis. And then in addition to that, we're going to have glucose getting uh, split into two molecules of pyruvate. Now, the next part of cellular respiration is what we call the prep reaction or the preparatory reaction. And that takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. So the matrix is, again, that inner space in the innermost space within the inner membrane. Okay. Now, pyruvate in this step is broken down to a two-carbon acetyl group carried by coenzyme A or CoA. And then in addition to that, we're going to get oxidation of pyruvate, and that's going to yield some more NADH. So that's what this little line here is showing. And we're also going to get some output of carbon dioxide. The next step that we'll talk about in more detail is going to be the citric acid cycle. And the citric acid cycle also takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. As oxidation occurs, you're going to get an additional output of more NADH and FADH2. Uh, so they are going to um, take those electrons to the electron transport chain eventually, and we will talk about that in a second, but that we get more of those outputted in the citric acid cycle. In addition to that, uh, once the citric acid cycle has run its course, we're also going to get an output of carbon dioxide as well as additional ATP molecules. And then the last major step of the cellular respiration uh, chain of re reactions is going to be the electron transport chain. And just like with photosynthesis, uh, the electron transport chain in cellular res respiration is a series of electron carriers that exist in the cristae of the mitochondria. So remember that the cristae is these inner foldings of the inner membrane. OK. Now at this point, NADH and FADH2 are going to give up the electrons that they have carried over from previous parts of the reaction. So from glycolysis, the preparatory reaction, and citric acid cycle. So all of those electrons they picked up, they have now moved them to be used to end the electron transport chain. Energy is released and captured as the electrons move from a state of higher energy to a state of lower energy through this electron transport chain. Later, this energy will be used for the production of ATP. And then oxygen is very important because it acts as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. And then when it accepts those final electrons uh, in the form of hydrogen ions, it will produce water as a byproduct. OK, so cellular respiration, water is a byproduct, whereas in photosynthesis, water is a starting reactant. OK. Alrighty, now that we have finished section 7.1, let us go ahead and move on to section 7.2, which is discusses outside the mitochondria glycolysis. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to explain the role of glycolysis in a cell, 
distinguish between the energy investment and energy harvesting steps of glycolysis and summarize how the metabolic pathway of glycolysis partially breaks down glucose. All right, to start off with, in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, glycolysis takes place within the cytoplasm of the cell. So in this diagram here, we have the outline of the steps of glycolysis. Notice that it takes place in the cytoplasm and not in the mitochondria. During glycolysis, glucose, which is a six carbon molecule, is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. And pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. So essentially, glucose is split in half. Now, glycolysis is divided into two major steps. The first step being the energy investment step, when some ATP is used to begin the reaction. And the second major phase is the energy harvesting step, where both NADH, depicted here, and ATP is produced. All right. OK, so let's first discuss the energy investment steps of glycolysis. So during the energy investment step, two ATP transfer phosphate groups to substrates, and to ADP plus an extra phosphate result. So why does this happen? Much the same way your car battery starts the engine, the transfer of phosphates activates the substrates so they can undergo the energy harvesting reaction. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this first energy investment step. So we have our six carbon glucose molecule. Okay, what's going to happen in this initial step is that two ATP molecules are going to be used. And when ATP is used and transfers energy, it becomes ADP. So think of ADP as the inactive state of ATP. Okay, so we're going to use some of the energy in ATP from two ATP molecules, and that is going to attach that extra phosphate group onto the ends of the glucose molecule. Okay, so one of the phosphates in ATP is going to be uh, attached here, and then the other phosphate is going to be attached here causing this conversion from ATP to ADP, okay? And then from there, we will end up with a split of glucose and we're going to have two what we call intermediate molecules within the reaction called G3P or glycerol aldehyde three phosphate for the longer version of the name, but we can just call it G3P and this Molecule here is just broken in half. So we have three carbons and a phosphate group and three carbons and a phosphate group. So we'll end up with two of these G3Ps at the end of the energy investment step. Okay, so the next phase of glycolysis is going to be the energy harvesting steps. So this phase is going to produce us three main products. We're going to get some ATP. We're going to get some NADH and then we're going to get some pyruvates. So let's discuss how we end up with those products. So we talked about this half already, so the energy investment step. So let's talk and focus our attention down here in the energy harvesting step. So following the creation of two G3P molecules as seen here, the next step is going to be to add an additional phosphate group on the other ends of both of the G3Ps, okay? And so when that phosphate group is attached, what's going to happen is that some of the leftover electrons that allow this attachment to take place are going to get transferred to our coenzyme NAD+, okay? So when they pick up those electrons, the NAD+, gets reduced to NADH. OK, and then when those like electrons are transferred, the phosphate gets attached to the other end of the G3P. Now, once this molecule has an additional phosphate group bound to it, we're going to get another intermediate molecule. And that molecule is going to be 1,3-biphosphoglycerate. OK, 
or BPG for short. Okay. And that's going to happen for both of the G3Ps. Okay. So this is all happening congruently together. Now, the next step that's going to happen is the creation of our first round of ATP. Okay. So when that happens, one of the phosphates is going to get plucked off of the end of BPG and transferred from to an ADP to remake ATP and reactivate ATP. Okay. And this is going to happen twice. So we're going to get a gain of two ATP. Now, when that phosphate is plucked off the end of uh, BPG, we're going to get a, another intermediate molecule. And that intermediate molecule is 3PG or 3 uh, phosphoglycerate. OK. All right. And then what's happening in this step to pluck that phosphate off of our uh, BPG is over here. OK, so at this step, what is happening is a fancy process called substrate level ATP synthesis, or another name for it is substrate level phosphorylation. OK, and at this particular step, when we're plucking off that phosphate group, uh, this enzyme is coming in. It's going to have two active sites, so these little indentions here. The active site is going to remove this phosphate off of our BPG and attach it to the ADP. And when ADP has that third phosphate group added onto it, it is reactivated into our energy molecule ATP. Okay, And this is called substrate level phosphorylation because it's all happening right on top of the substrate that we're working with, with enzymes in the cytoplasm. Okay. Now, the next major step that's going to take place is the second round of substrate level phosphorylation, where the other phosphate group is plucked off the end of 3PG. Okay, And the same process is happening again, just on the other end, uh, where an enzyme is going to come in, attach to the substrate, attach to an ADP, remove and pluck off the phosphate group, producing more ATP. Okay, And this is all happening twice and congruently with the two molecules of G3P, OK? So now we're going to get even more ATP out of that, all right? And then at the end, what we're left with, once those phosphate groups are plucked off the ends, we're going to have just a three carbon molecule. And that three carbon molecule is called pyruvate, OK? So what we have here is this first step, which gets us two coenzymes that have been reduced from NAD plus to NADH. And then we're also going to net gain to ATP. Now, the reason we say net gain is, again, because we had to invest ATP to get the process started. So even though we technically produced four down here, because we invested two, we actually just end up with a net gain of two additional ATP at the end of the process. So again, what we have at the end of glycolysis, essentially, is pyruvate, some ATP, and some NADH. Now, in addition to that, we do have a little bit of water coming out. But water is just a byproduct of this reaction and is not needed for extra steps later down the line. OK, so let us talk a little bit and summarize all of the things we have discussed in previous slides concerning glycolysis. All right. So in this table here is just the summaries of what we started with, our inputs, and what we ended up with, our outputs. Okay, So at the beginning of glycolysis, we started out with a single molecule of glucose. We also started out with 2 NAD+. Okay? In addition to that, we had to invest 2 ATP to get the process going. And then we also started out with 4 ADP because we haven't activated them back to ATP. So we have some of some ADP sitting around. And we also have four phosphates sitting around. Okay. So these are our, our initial inputs for the process of glycolysis. Now, once all of those steps are complete that we just talked about in the last two slides, we'll end up with their outputs. So in total, at the end of glycolysis, we'll have two pyruvates. We will have two NADH that have been reduced from NAD plus. 
we will have a leftover of two ADP because we had to start out with two ATP. So two ATP were invested and uh, that phosphate was removed and, de and deactivated the ATP producing ADP. So we have two of those. And then in the end, uh, we ended up with a total of four ATP at the end of the reaction, but we technically only netted two ATP because of that initial investment of two ATP. All right. So this is our overview of inputs and outputs of glycolysis. Now, the question from here is how the reaction proceeds is determined by whether or not oxygen is present. In a eukaryotic cell, if oxygen is available, the end product of glycolysis, which is mostly pyruvate and NADH, will enter the aerobic reaction within mitochondria, where it is used to generate more ATP. Okay, so aerobic just means oxygen present. Okay, so if oxygen is present, pyruvate enters the mitochondria. If oxygen is not present, pyruvate enters the anaerobic fermentation pathways. In humans, for example, if oxygen is not available, pyruvate is reduced to lactate. And because the anaerobic pathways also occur in the cytoplasm, we will discuss those in the next section. Okay, so that concludes section 7.2. So let's jump into section 7.3, outside the mitochondria fermentation. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to explain the role of the fermentation pathways in biological organisms and give examples of products that are produced by fermentation. Okay. So the complete breakdown of glucose requires an input of oxygen to keep the electron transport chain working. If oxygen is either absent or limited, pyruvate molecules accumulate in the cell and the NAD plus and FAD intermediates cannot be recycled. To correct for this, cells may enter anabolic pathways such as fermentation when oxygen is low or lacking. And fermentation is going to follow the process of glycolysis. There are two basic forms of fermentation, lactic acid and alcohol fermentation. Let us first talk about lactic acid fermentation. In animals and some bacteria, the pyruvate formed by glycolysis is going to accept two hydrogen atoms and is reduced to lactate. In the water environment of the cell, this forms lactic acid. <clears throat> so basically, NADH passes hydrogen atoms to pyruvate, reducing it and thus NADH is recycled back down to NAD+. So that uh, NAD+, is continuously regenerated. Um, so that is essentially why it is beneficial for pyruvate to be reduced to lactic acid in the first place when oxygen is not available. So the regeneration of NAD+, allows them to pick up more electrons during the earlier reaction, reactions of glycolysis. And the regeneration of NAD plus keeps glycolysis going during which ATP is produced by substrate level phosphorylation or substrate level ATP. <clears throat> the two ATP produced by the anabolic processes of glycolysis and fermentation represent only a small fraction of the potential energy stored in glucose molecules. Following fermentation, most of this potential energy is still waiting to be released. Despite the low yield of only two ATP, the anabolic pathways are essential. They can provide a rapid burst of ATP and muscle cells are more apt than other cells to carry on fermentation. 
when our muscle cells are working vigorously over a short period of time, as we run, for example, fermentation is a way to produce ATP, even though oxygen is temporarily in limited supply. When we stop running, our bodies are in an oxygen deficit, as indicated by the fact that we continue to breathe very rapidly for a um, short period of time. Recovery is complete when enough oxygen is present to completely break down glucose. Blood carries away the lactate that is formed in the muscles and transports it to the liver, which is then reconverted to pyruvate to carry on the cellular additional steps of cellular respiration. Some of the pyruvate is oxidized completely, and the rest is converted back to glucose. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about alcoholic fermentation. So in other organisms, such as bacteria and fungi, pyruvate is reduced to produce alcohol. As was the case with lactic acid fermentation, the electrons needed to reduce the pyruvate are supplied by NADH molecules. In the process, NAD plus molecules are regenerated for use in glycolysis. However, unlike lactic acid fermentation, alcoholic fermentation also releases small amounts of carbon dioxide. Yeast is a type of fungi are a good example of microorganisms that generate ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide when they carry out fermentation. When yeasts are used to le uh, leaven bread, for example, the carbon dioxide makes the bread rise. When yeasts are used to ferment grapes for wine production or to ferment wort uh, derived from barley, uh, for beer production, ethyl alcohol is the desired product. However, the yeasts are killed by the very product they produce. So in this table here, we just have a summarization of the inputs and outputs of fermentation. So like glycolysis, the inputs are pretty much the same. So you have one molecule of glucose, you have two NADH that uh, you're going to start with, um, and then you also have an investment of two ATP and then an additional four ADP and four uh, phosphate groups. Um, the big, the main difference here is that there are no NAD plus because we're going to produce NAD plus in the end. And then our outputs for fermentation, depending on the type. So if you're lactic acid fermentation, you're going to produce lactate. And if you're alcoholic fermentation, you're going to produce alcohol and carbon dioxide. But in addition to that, you're also going to um, regenerate NAD+. You're going to produce ADP from the in initial investment of ATP. You're also going to end up with four ATP in the end. But because of that initial investment of two ATP, you will still only net two ATP in fermentation as well. Okay, so this image is kind of just um, a summarization of what happens in fermentation visually. So this first half up here is just summarizing the process of glycolysis that we've already discussed in detail. But following the process of glycolysis, you're going to end up with that pyruvate molecule. So in order to regenerate NAD plus to continue producing ATP uh, up in glycolysis, we have to also reduce pyruvate. So when pyruvate is reduced, the extra hydrogen ions and electrons from the NAD plus is going to get oxidized to NAD. Um, NADH uh, is going to get oxidized to NAD plus. Okay. So those extra electrons over here are going to get taken off, producing NAD plus and given to the pyruvate. So since the electrons are getting moved to the pyruvate, pyruvate is being reduced. Okay. NAD H is being oxidized, pyruvate is being reduced. And depending on if you are a, an animal, you will uh, produce lactate as the byproduct. And if you are microorganisms such as bacteria or yeast, you will produce ethyl alcohol and the carbon dioxide as a byproduct in this process of reducing pyruvate to regenerate NAD plus so that it could be reused up in glycolysis to produce more ATP. Okay. 
And that's essentially what fermentation is. It's just a need to recycle um, our electron carrier here and oxidize it back to NAD+, so it can pick up more electrons to attach phosphate groups so that more ATP can be produced in the end. And that pretty much summarizes the steps that I expect you to know for fermentation, both lactic acid and ethyl, ethyl alcohol fermentation. Alrighty, now that we have finished section 7.3, let us go ahead and jump into section 7.4 inside the mitochondria. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to identify the roles of the preparatory reaction and the citric acid cycle in cellular respiration, specify how the electron transport chain produces most of the ATP during cellular respiration, and explain the role of oxygen in cellular respiration. Okay, so before we dive into the specifics of the internal mechanisms of cellular respiration within the mitochondria, let us review some of the features of the mitochondria. So in this image here, we have a depiction of the cytoplasm on the outside, and then this is an actual mitochondria here. And then some features to remember and make note of is the inner and outer uh, membrane layers. Okay, so the inner membrane is depicted in yellow. The inner membrane is important because it has these cristae, which are these inner foldings of the inner membrane to allow for more surface area. And then the outer membrane is depicted as brown in this uh, particular diagram. Now there are two compartments and chambers within the mitochondria. The innermost compartment is called the matrix. Okay, so that is the innermost chamber within the inside of the inner membrane. And then the other compartment is in between the two membranes, which is going to be the uh, intermembrane space. So that's located here. So intermembrane space is the space in between the two membranes inside the mitochondria. Now, the majority of the processes of cellular respiration occur along the cristae of the inner membrane. Okay, so let's dive into that. <clears throat> okay, so to start off with, we are going to get to the specifics of the preparatory reaction. So, the purpose of the preparatory reaction or prep reaction is to prepare the outputs of glycolysis, primarily the pyruvate molecules, for use in the citric acid cycle. These reactions occur within the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, so in our diagram here, we have the preparatory reaction. It's going to occur in the matrix, so that's the innermost space of the mitochondria, uh, and it's going to happen before the citric acid cycle. Okay. Now, during the preparatory reaction, there are three main things that take place. First and foremost, the pyruvate is oxidized, and a carbon dioxide molecule is given off as a result. Now, this is part of the carbon dioxide we actually breathe out in our normal breathing. The next thing that happens is that another NAD plus coenzyme is going to accept electrons and hydrogen ions and become reduced forming NADH, okay? So just as with glycolysis, we do have an output of coenzymes, NADH, okay? And then the third main thing that happens with the preparatory reaction is that the product, which is a two carbon acetyl group attached to coenzyme A, is going to be formed. And we typically call this product collectively acetyl-CoA. Okay, so that is the main product that is going to get introduced into the citric acid cycle. Now, because glycolysis splits each glucose into two pyruvate molecules, the preparatory reaction occurs twice per glucose molecule. Therefore, for each glucose that started glycolysis, the outputs are two molecules of carbon dioxide, two NADH, and two acetyl-CoAs. These acetyl-CoA molecules, again, enter the next stage of cellular respiration and are the starting material for the citric acid cycle. All right, so let's talk about the citric acid cycle. Now the citric acid cycle is a cyclic 
metabolic pathway located in the matrix of the mitochondria. It was originally called the Krebs cycle to honor the scientist who first studied it, but now we call it the citric acid cycle. At the start of the citric acid cycle, the two carbon acetyl-CoA joins with a four carbon molecule producing a six carbon citrate molecule. The CoA part is released and is used again in the preparatory reaction. Now, there are three main things that are happening within the citric acid cycle. First and foremost, that acetyl group is oxidized. And in the process of that oxidation, it's going to form carbon dioxide. Next, both NAD plus as well as a second coenzyme FAD are going to accept enzymes and hydrogen ions, and they are going to be reduced to NADH and FADH2 respectively. And then finally, the last main thing that is happening in the citric acid cycle is that there is going to be additional substrate level ATP synthesis occurring or substrate level phosphorylation. And we're going to have uh, some ATP result from the process of the citric acid cycle. All right. So those are the main things that are happening in the citric acid cycle. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of what's happening in this figure. Okay, so first and foremost, the first step that's happening is that pyruvate is going from glycolysis is going to enter into the citric acid cycle um, or enter into the mitochondrium. Before it is used in the citric acid cycle, it's going to undergo that preparatory reaction. So that's what's happening right here. Uh, so that pyruvate uh, is going to get modified. Uh, some CO2 is going to be um, given off when pyruvate is oxidized. And when that happens, we're going to have some NAD plus get reduced to NADH. And then in addition to that, we're going to get uh, acetyl-CoA formed when we get that coenzyme A attached to the carbons. And that acetyl-CoA is the result of the preparatory reaction, and the acetyl-CoA is what gets introduced into the actual cycle itself. Okay. Now, the next step that happens is that each of the two acetyl-CoA groups um, are going to combine with a four-carbon carb molecule to produce citric acid, which is a six-carbon molecule. Okay, so we're going to end up with six carbons at the first step. All right. Now, this molecule is then oxidized in step three, and it's going to give off carbon dioxide as well as reduce NAD plus to NADH. Okay, then it will happen again when more carbons are taken off in the form of carbon dioxide. Uh, another reduction of NAD plus is going to happen a second time. Okay, down here um, we're going to have the loss of two carbon dioxides uh, at the this step, and that's going to result in a four carbon molecule. Okay, because we took two off in these first two processes. All right, now. In this step, we're going to have um, substrate level ATP synthesis or substrate level phosphorylation. Um, and that's going to give us an output of some ATP, not that much, but some. And then the last parts of the reaction are going to be reducing uh, the second coenzyme FADH2 um, or reducing FAD to FADH2 and then following us uh, another reduction of NAD plus to NADH. Okay, so we're breaking down the glucose in the, uh, in the form of acetyl-CoA addition, in uh, additional steps. And in the process of that, we're producing ATP and we are picking up electrons using our electron carriers, our coenzymes, NADH and FADH2. Okay, now additional, um, after those additional reductions take place, we're going to regenerate a four carbon molecule that is then going to uh, be used again in this step to combine the four carbon molecule with the acetyl-CoA. And we're going to start again because it is a uh, cyclic process. So again, the main things that are happening are these reductions to uh, have our coenzymes pick up electrons to take to the electron transport chain. We're also going to have a lot of carbon dioxide given off in the process. That's the carbon dioxide we breathe in and out. Um, and then finally, 
uh, we are going to have a little bit of ATP produced in this cycle as well. Okay, so let us review the outputs and inputs of the citric acid cycle. So again, when we are starting the citric acid cycle, we're primarily going to be starting with those two acetyl-CoA's that are the product of the preparatory reaction, okay? We're also going to have some NAD plus that will eventually need to be reduced, as well as FAD that will also eventually need to be reduced. And then we're also going to have a few ADPs uh, ready to be activated to ATP, okay? And then the outputs of this citric acid cycle is four carbon dioxide, six NADHs, and two FADH2, as well as two ATP, okay? Now notice that these inputs and outputs are all doubled. And the reason for that is, is because the citric acid cycle turns twice for each original glucose. And that is because we have two pyruvates at the end of glycolysis. Those two pyruvates are gonna get modified in the preparatory reaction to get two acetyl-CoA's. And so for per one glucose molecule, uh, we are gonna get two turns of the citric acid cycle to break up both of the acetyl-CoA's. <clears throat> All right, let us move on. Okay, so the second thing that happens in, or the next reaction that happens in the mitochondria is going to be the electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain is located in the Christe of the mitochondria and is a series of carriers that pass electrons from one to another. Okay, so NADH and FADH2 deliver electrons to the chain. Now consider that hydrogen atoms attached to NADH and FADH2 consist of an electron and a hydrogen ion. And essentially, the carriers of the electron transport chain accept only electrons and not hydrogens. Okay, so in this particular image, it's just kind of an overview of all the processes that have produced our coenzyme. So in the cytoplasm, we got some NADH from glycolysis. Okay, we also got some more NADH from the preparatory reaction. And then we got even more coenzymes um, in terms in the form of six NADH and two FADH2 uh, that were also going to be transporting electrons from the broken down glucose to the electron transport chain. Okay, so all of these segments of cellular respiration have produced those coenzymes, those carriers to transport the electrons from the glucose to the electron transport chain. Okay. Okay. Now, <clears throat> notice that high energy electrons are being transferred by our uh, electron carriers, our coenzymes NADH and FADH2 from glycolysis, again, the preparatory reaction, and the citric acid cycle. And the electron transport chain is a series of redox reactions that remove the high energy electrons from NADH and FADH2. And then as these reactions occur, we are going to be releasing energy and that will be captured for ATP production later. Now, the final acceptor of the electrons in the electron transport chain is oxygen, okay? Your breathing provides the oxygen for cellular respiration. Overall, the role of oxygen in cellular respiration is to act as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. So why can oxygen play this role? Well, that is because oxygen attracts electrons to a greater degree than do the carriers in the chain, okay? So we learned a few chapters ago that oxygen is extreme, very highly, extremely electronegative. So it attracts electrons to itself. So once oxygen accepts electrons, it combines with hydrogen ions to form a water molecule. And water is one of the end products of cellular respiration. Now, once NADH has delivered electrons to the electron transport chain, it is oxidized back to NAD plus, 
and NAD plus is regenerated and can be used again. In the same manner, FAD is also um, generated and can also be used again. The recycling of coenzymes, and for that matter, ADP, increases cellular efficiency because it does away with the need to synthesize new coenzymes, NAD plus FAD, as well as new ADP each time the reaction occurs. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about how the electron transport chain is organized in, in space in the cristae of the mitochondria. So again, the electron transport chain is a series of electron carriers, mostly proteins, located within the inner membrane of the mitochondrial, um, of the mitochondria. ATP synthesis is carried out by ATP synthase complexes that are also located along the cristae of the inner membrane. Now notice that NADH and FADH2 do not produce the same amount of ATP. That is because NADH delivers electrons to the first carrier of the electron transport chain, whereas FADH2 delivers electrons later in the chain. Okay. For this reason, the electrons from each NADH produce three ATP, but the electrons from each FADH2 produce only two ATP. Okay. Now, just as in photosynthesis, the energy that is released while these electrons are being transported down the chain and eventually accepted by oxygen to produce water is being used to produce a proton gradient. Okay. So, in this case, the higher concentration is going to take, uh, be located in the inner membrane space. So that's the space in between the outer and inner membrane of the mitochondria. So the electron transport chain is pumping hydrogens using energy against their concentration gradient to concentrate them on the outside of the inner membrane in the intermembrane space. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the ATP synthase. So again, just as in photosynthesis, the hydrogen ion gradient contains a large amount of stored energy that can be used to drive forward ATP synthesis. The cristae of the mitochondria contain an ATP synthase complex that allows hydrogen ions to return to the matrix. Okay, So just like in photosynthesis, the hydrogen ions act like a dam, uh, or the hydrogen ions act like water, and the ATP synthase complex acts like a dam. And the hydrogen ions, once their gradient is established uh, through the electron transport chain, are going to flow back down their concentration gradient through the ATP synthase, just like water flowing through a dam. And this diffusion through the ATP synthase complex is going to power the actual production of ATP. Okay, So the hydrogen ion gradient is the actual process that powers ATP synthase to convert ADP to ATP, producing lots and lots of ATP. All right, so this last image here is just showing how the electron transport chain and ATP synthase complex work together to generate ATP. All of this is located in the cristae of the mitochondria. Okay, This space down here is the matrix, and this space up here is the intermembrane space. So our carriers, uh, our coenzyme carriers, are bringing in electrons to start at the, uh, the front of the chain. So NADH starts at the beginning, FADH2 starts a little bit further down. So they deposit their electrons through the proteins in the electron transport chain. The energy released from these transfers is going to power the movement of hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Okay. Eventually, the electrons will finish their journey uh, through the electron transport chain and be accepted by oxygen 
Once they are accepted by oxygen, oxygen becomes water. All right, so that's a byproduct of cellular respiration. So we have established our hydrogen ion gradient, all right? So it's highly concentrated in the intermembrane space and not so much in the matrix. So what's going to happen over here in during the actual synthesis of ATP is that the hydrogen ions um, are going to flow back down their concentration gradient through ATP synthase complex like water through a dam, okay? And those hydrogen ions are going to flow back down their gradient, powering the conversion of ADP to ATP, producing that uh, energy molecule ATP. Okay. So again, the actual process that is powering the production of ATP is the hydrogen ion gradient that is established by the electron transport chain. Okay. Okay, so that concludes section 7.4. So let's go ahead and jump into the last section of the chapter, which is 7.5, metabolic fate of food. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to calculate the amount of ATP produced by each glucose molecule entering cellular respiration, and then recognize how alternate metabolic pathways allow proteins and fats to be used for ATP synthesis. Uh, ATP synthesis or ATP production. Okay, so to start off with, for each glucose, there is a net gain of two ATP from glycolysis, which takes place in the cytoplasm. The citric acid cycle, which occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria, accounts for two ATP per glucose as well. This means that a total of four ATP form due to the substrate level ATP synthesis outside the electron transport chain. Most of the ATP produced comes from the electron transport chain and the ATP synthase complex. For each glucose, 10 AD, uh, NADH and 2-FADH2 take electrons from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle to the electron transport chain. The maximum number of ATP produced by the chain is therefore 34 ATP, and the maximum number produced by both the chain and substrate level ATP synthesis is 38. However, not all cells produce the maximum yield. Metabolic differences cause some cells to produce 36 or fewer ATP. Still, a yield of 36 to 38 ATP represents about 40% of the energy that was initially available in the glucose molecule. The rest of the energy is lost in the form of heat. Okay, so the last topic that we're going to talk about is discussing alternative metabolic pathways. So you probably know that you can obtain energy from foods other than carbohydrates. For example, your body has the means of obtaining energy from a meal of pepperoni pizza, not all of which is a carbohydrate. Let's start with the fats in the cheese and meat. When a fat is used as an energy source, it breaks down into glycerol and three fatty acid chains. Because glycerol is a carbohydrate, it enters the process of cellular respiration during glycolysis. Okay. Fatty acids can be met metabolized to acetyl groups, which enter via the citric acid cycle. Okay. A fatty acid with a chain of 18 carbons can make three times the number of acetyl groups than a glucose molecule does. For this reason, fats are an efficient form of stored energy. The complete breakdown of glycerol and fatty acids results in many more ATP per fat molecule than does the breakdown of a glucose molecule. Okay. So in our diagram here, discussing carbohydrates, fats, and oils, carbohydrates are, you know, immediately in the form of glucose, jump into glycolysis and 
go down the process of cellular respiration as we have discussed throughout the chapter. Fats and oils can enter into different points along cellular respiration depending on if it's converted to glycerol or not, or if it's in the form of fatty acids. So if it's, it gets converted to glycerol, it also enters in glycolysis. And if it's in the form of fatty acids, it will enter in the form of acetyl-CoA and then jump into the citric acid cycle from there. So how about the proteins in the pepperoni? Only the hydrocarbon backbone of amino acids can be used by cellular respiration pathways. The amino group becomes ammonia, which becomes part of urea, which is the primary excretory product of humans and urine. Just where the hydrocarbon backbone from an amino group begins degradation to produce ATP depends on its length. So this figure over here shows that the hydrocarbon backbone from an amino acid can enter cellular respiration pathways at the pyruvate level as acetyl-CoA or even during the citric acid cycle. The smaller molecules can also be used to synthesize larger molecules. In such instances, ATP is used instead of generated. For example, some substrates of the citric acid cycle can become amino acids through the addition of an amino group, and these amino acids can be employed to synthesize proteins. Similarly, substrates from glycolysis can become glycerol, and acetyl groups can be used to produce fatty acids. When glycerol and three fatty acids join, the result is a molecule of fat, a triglyceride, and this explains why you can gain weight from eating a very carbohydrate-rich food in your diet. And that's about it for talking about alternative metabolic pathways. And with that, we have concluded the topics covered in chapter seven. I hope everyone has a wonderful week.